your um, expectations and values become reliable throughout the organization. So those would be a few things that I would uh, That whole consistency is pretty important, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. You can't say one thing and then shift real quickly for another person. It just leaves people feeling isolated and devalued and um, and, and it gives the impression that you, you're not very clear yeah. about your vision. Yeah, yeah. Yes. When you think about your work at the Health Museum uh, and your leadership there, you know, sometimes when we, when we move to different places, we, we bring the best and we try to change the things that maybe weren't working as well. When you for think sure. about that transition, how has that been for you? What have you kept and what have you thought, well, let me ch switch it up a little bit? Well, at the Health Museum, it was pure transformational. Yeah. And you'll find that quite a bit in nonprofits. Um, uh, you know, people would say, we, we want to go to the next level. Yeah. And we want to build awareness. We are the best kept secret. And at the Health Museum, that transformation was quite, quite necessary. Yeah. Because yeah. at that time, kind of the life cycle of a business, you get to a point where you plateau and you've got to be very disruptive yeah. in order to change and, and make things happen because you're either going to fall off the cliff or you're going to go up. And so um, uh, it was my leadership style at the Health Museum was all about um, fostering a culture of innovation. Yeah. And the way in which you do that is certainly on the opposite end of the spectrum of micromanagement. Right. Uh, you've got to manage, of course, and I'm always very curious and want to be aware, made aware of everything um, on a high level, but it's really about um, staying out of people's way so they can think and create and respond, mess up, and yeah. then course correct. Yeah. Yes. And when you came over, so going from that transformational to an organization that many see as like, wow, this is a gold standard Absolutely. organization. How is that for you? So now I'm sitting on my hands, right? Yeah. <laughs> Trying my best not to mess with stuff. And I yeah. am uh, literally being the best listener, and, and it's certain, certainly a level of growth for me because it's one of the few places that I've gone that's been so financially solvent. Yeah. And so um, uh, just in order, and especially in terms of the mission. There is no mission creep here. Mm -hmm. And um, so it is, it's about listening, and it's so wonderful because every day I'll tell you, I, I think I've got it pegged, and something comes back and proves me completely wrong, and I'm so happy about that. Yeah. Yes. Looking from the outside and knowing Collaborative for Children and being a dear friend of Carol Shattuck, who yes. was the CEO there, uh, but if I try to figure out what could be different, I, I look at Collaborative and I think gold standard, uh, the, a wonderful thing, but I'm not sure it's as transformational as it was. So in terms of trying new things, when you come in, is that does the board say we want that? I mean, are they seeing the same things? They are, and yeah. and they, they they want that. They just don't want it disruptively. Of course, yes. Yeah, so right? they 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 were very clear at the outset um, upon recruitment that they wanted to go to the next level, and yeah. they wanted to differentiate from so many other education or early childhood education entities in the community. Yeah. So we've got to be risk takers in order to make that differentiation. Yeah, yeah. And we've got to get some really significant, strong data that proves that this is clearly who we are instead of in this big bucket of just everyone who's trying to join yeah, the yeah. movement. So Dr. Johnson, give us an idea of your own background. I, you grew up in yes, Alabama? I did. I grew up in a little bitty town in the deep south called Tuskegee, Alabama. Oh, yes. And it actually... It's, it's, it's a famous little town. Well, I, yeah, I like yeah. to think so, yeah. right? But sometimes I find that <laughs> I'm the only one who, who yeah. knows of it. Um, but in Tuskegee, Alabama, um, it's, it's a beautiful town, rich in history, however, yeah. quite destitute when it comes to... Um, economics mm -hmm. and education. Mm -hmm. And I fell somewhat um, marginalized when I came to education in yeah. maybe in the middle school and high school ages. And what saved me then was museums. Mm -hmm. And I went to the George Washington Carver Museum and I went to the Booker T. Washington Museum and the Tuskegee Airmen's Museum. And yeah. I thought, boy, if school were like this, I would fall back in love with it completely because I, I learned to love the sciences from Dr. George Washington Carver Museum. I learned to love travel and exploration and geography from the Tuskegee yeah. Airmen. And um, 
And so I set out on that course to do things very unorthodox in terms of education. Yeah. So I did that throughout my career, even if, if I were in a formal classroom or in an informal classroom, such as a museum, yeah. um, my goal was to shake things up a bit in terms of how people would learn and receive information. Ha did your parents go to college? They did. Yeah. They went there, Tuskegee University. Yeah. Um, my mother actually uh, got her graduate degree at Tuskegee University. Okay. So, um, yeah, they did go to college. Yeah. And then they were, I'm the youngest of four girls. And so wow. we all went to college as well. And you went to Auburn? I did. And how was that experience for you? Um, Wonderful. However, it is a major culture shift and um, little town to big university. Little right? town, little small historically African American town yeah. to uh, big university and primarily Caucasian. Yeah, and a it's big so white funny. It's, yes, <laughs> <laughs> and so it's funny because the towns are fi literally 15 minutes apart but worlds oh, wow. apart in terms wow. of culture and belief systems and values and, and the things that we thought about each other across yeah. the track, you know, yeah. were just amazingly different. And did you have leadership experiences in college that started this development of you as a leader? I did in high school, actually. Yeah. So, um, yes, I, I had lots of opportunities in a high school where um, I, I don't feel the teachers were had the training to be as in control as they'd like to have been. And so a lot of um, students had a lot of opportunity to either come in, into control from a, a, a not so good place and from a good place. And yeah. so I literally, I can recall taking some of my teachers to the principal's office and saying, you know, I don't think that this is appropriate. <laughs> Wow. So uh, I gained some leadership skills there. I was a cheerleader, too. I was a cheerleader my entire life. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, we didn't have You many... were a cheerleader in college I, as well? I was not in college. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Um, but I was a cheerleader but in high school. school. Yeah, yeah. At the university, in terms of leadership, um, I think it was just taking advantage of the opportunities there on the campus and, and leading your own life yeah. more so. It was that there was no one, like many college students, there's right. no one to guide your course and so right. it was about making choices and, and taking leadership of my life. Yeah mm -hmm. and then if you fast forward to Houston right and you've come to Houston yes. what brings you to Houston in the first place Melanie? Uh, the beautiful diversity yeah. uh, and opportunities and uh, diversity and opportunities yeah. diversity in people with whom you'd interact um, it's just amazing this city I, I love this city so much and in fact, I've been here about 27 years, and so I call it home now, um, yeah. second home at least, uh, because it's got so many things that you can get into if you want to shake things up, and I, I really am that in terms of education. It's interesting, across the Deep South, a lot of people don't realize, but people go to college in the Deep South, and they start thinking about moving to Houston or Atlanta, Washington, D.C., yes. these big cities that seem to have lots of economic opportunity, That's right? right. That's right. Yeah. And very few of us are still in the community who went to college because right. there were very limited opportunities yeah. here. There's yeah. a historically black college in Tuskegee and um, uh, but very other few other industries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit about uh, uh, you taking this job at the Health Museum, what prompted that first? Well, I was a director of education at NASA's Space Center Houston mm -hmm. for a number of years, and I absolutely loved that. Um, but it was a lot of managing from the middle, yeah. and managing from the middle has its limitations. So you can manage up, manage yeah. your, your, your leader or the CEO. Um, who had been in the position for a number of years, mm -hmm. and uh, you can manage down and manage your team, and then you, your team finally realizes that you only have but so much latitude. So I thought the next juncture was to get more autonomy and become yeah. a president and CEO. When the Health Museum came calling, I jumped right on board. Yeah, and was it, because people here running a museum, that's gotta be a great job. I even think yes. that could be a great job running a museum. Uh, but it's not everything it sounds like, right? I mean, you're still trying to raise a lot of money. You're still oh, dealing absolutely. with the board. You're still dealing with personnel. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Um, it's the operations, and it it is as exciting as it sounds, mm -hmm. but you're right. It is. It has all the rudimentary things that a leader in a nonprofit agency or just any agency yeah. that runs a physical space 
would have to What was endure. your biggest leadership challenge there? Was it that transformation of making the museum more visible and viable as an organization? It was um, because we were able to make it more visible by yeah. a, a massive uh, communications campaign. Yeah. But then at the same token, when we got people uh, interested in coming into the museum and made people aware of it, they'd come in and they would say, it looks the same. So yeah. we couldn't follow through. We didn't yeah. have the funds to necessarily follow through. So we found some ways to make the transformation incremental. Uh, we used a lot of the educators and the education program, Human Capital, yeah. to give uh, unique experiences on the, on the museum floor uh, until we were able to raise money later on by more people coming into the building yeah. um, to add some unique exhibit experiences. When you think about all the museums you've visited and that you've heard of around the world, uh, and I've been to many too. I love these I things. I love you museums. Know? And when you think about those that are different, but where people really learn, are there a couple that sort of come to mind as particularly innovative for you? Yes. Um, in Washington, D.C., there's a museum called the Newseum. It's a great museum. It is my favorite. It's yeah. absolutely my favorite um, because they chronicle all of the, our nation's history, even a global history yeah. in that museum. But they give you a, a glimpse of little artifacts in some of the turmoil in our nation's history as well as some of the successes. So yeah. I love it. From World War II to civil rights to yeah. everything you can think of. It's a it's a great museum and, and you know all these free museums in DC, but you have to pay to go to the museum. Yes. But once you've paid you realize, oh yeah, that was worth it. It right? is so worth yeah, it. Yeah, yes. Because it's 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 really very good. Yes. Uh, talk about boards for a little bit. Sure. Are you seeing, you know, from the, the different positions you've had, and specifically uh, the Health Museum and now Collaborative for Children, two different types of agencies, do people join those boards for different reasons? Uh, and, are, or is it, and do you have the same, same challenges, though, with those boards? Sure. I think that you will always have similar challenges with boards, uh, specifically for nonprofits, but not necessarily just nonprofits, for for-profit agencies. Um, I, I see similar challenges and, and opportunities because people are just innately um, driven by their own desires. Mm -hmm. And so it's the one agency where you don't really have to know, you know, nonprofits, you don't really have to know the business. You can simply just fall in love with the mission or want to meet the right people or you just want to become the right person. Mm -hmm. And so um, there are a number of reasons why people join boards. What makes them quite volatile for the agency, and I, I'll just be so candid, yeah. um, is that it is that one entity where uh, they don't, the buck stops with the community volunteer mm -hmm. who might have a plethora of different reasons why they are serving on mm -hmm. the board of directors. And mm -hmm. when the buck stops with someone who's not intimately engaged in the know-how of the, the um, nonprofit, it can become sticky sometimes. So you have yeah. to really um, hone the, the, the human capital skills to yeah. be able to, um, to navigate that. And it's interesting how one or two board members, one board member can really change sort of a culture of a board, can't For it? For sure, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, for the better or for the worse sometimes, Yes, right? indeed, yes. Yeah, we've all had these challenges, right? Uh, you know, it's interesting when you get together a number of CEOs of nonprofits, I always say it's it's usually going to be the board or your staff that we're talking about. That's right, right. exactly. Of, and those are the things that and make everyone's us, talking about it. <laughs> yeah, they make us or break us. That's it's right. Sort of an interesting deal. When you look at the landscape of nonprofits mm -hmm. uh, in our community and across America, what are some of the big issues uh, that you feel as a leader uh, that we're facing as nonprofits? Um. Trying to own our credibility, mm. you know, because there's a there's a significant level of distrust with what we're doing with the money and what yeah. we're doing in terms of the mission and if we are really who we say we are. Yeah. And um, so we have to make sure that we uphold our values and our mission and our vision so that people can trust that we are doing the social good. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a big deal. And when you look at our own social issues across this country, I mean, and we face a number of them, and some of them that we've faced are sort of risen up and are facing us even more. Yes. How as nonprofit leaders can we address some of those things sometimes? Because it seems that we should be in a position to, to really deal with some of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, 
it's fundamentally who we are, you yeah. know, and it takes a community to, to elevate a community to a higher plane. And um, I, I think absolutely, you know, nonprofits, if, if no one else, uh, have the latitude to do the things that um, big corporations and right. um, big bureau bureaucracies don't yeah. have the latitude to be able to just go directly and, and, and manage. Yeah. Yes. Very interesting, isn't it? All right, I'm going to bring us out to the Twitterverse, see what uh, students are sending their tweets in as we speak, and let's pick a couple of good ones here. Uh, oh, here's a good one. So Jennifer wants to know, board members. Uh, of course. And this is good. <laughs> so do board members usually represent the population that, that, that we serve? I think that's a great question. That's an excellent question. Specifically, and I'm going to speak in terms of the museum because a yeah. lot of data and a lot of studies were done uh, nationally about boards and museums. And, and um, it was interesting that the data reveal on a national level, and, and I see it very evident, even in as diverse as Houston is, um, that most boards desire to be more diverse. Yeah. But as much as that, as strong as that desire is, uh, because you know board recommendations come from the people within who are already seated on the, in the board seats, um, they don't tend to be as diverse, and yeah. they are absolutely upside down in terms of diversity. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's when I think about our board, and ostensibly we represent the children of Texas, right? Yes. Uh, and so that would be a very diverse group. You know, we have had to be super intentional, right? <laughs> Uh, and, and, and saying, yeah, maybe this old white guy has a lot of money, but listen, we, this is not the, what we want. This right. is not, we want the money. But we want to hear. We yeah. want the money, yes, yeah, but, but we, we want to hear We need more diversity. People. But you're right. It's not until you have, I mean, for us, it wasn't until we found a prominent Latino and a prominent African-American who, who knew that that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to recruit a diverse board yes. that they became super engaged. It, yes. But it wasn't until that happened because... Board members recruit people like themselves. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And so you've got to know someone outside of your box, and you've got to be open because there's chemistry that, that creates this community, right, of yeah. board members. And so you've got to be open to other chemistries, you yeah. know. Yes. And you can't just do lip service on some of these things either. No, you can't. You yeah. have, and it's from the top down yeah. where the intentionality begins. Yeah, very interesting. All right. Um, so Sarah wants to know, what is one piece of advice for a young professional taking on their first leadership role in a nonprofit organization? What's a piece of advice you might give? Uh, be very vigilant. Mm -hmm. look, what do you mean by that? Look at everything um, because I, and in fact, it happens when you're a new CEO or new leader, oftentimes uh, there will be people, staff members who come forth and um, share their points of view uh, from their perspectives and you might be tempted to act on that point of view and eventually down the line it might disprove itself mm -hmm. and so to be very very watchful of everything um, cultural norms and ethos and uh, your board and how they act and interact with each other and and listen very well yeah. you'll hear them say things like we went to summer camp together when we were three years old. Well, you know that that's, there's no division there. <laughs> <laughs> They've been together forever. So yeah. listen to everything and watch everything. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I also went to summer camp. That's so. right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, Kerwin wants to know, he's saying, uh, was it difficult for you as a black woman from the South? He says, you have a resume second to none. But was it difficult as a black woman from the South getting your foot in the door in some of these places that you've worked? I, I, I haven't experienced difficulty, and yeah. it could have been difficult, but I just never, I had no blinders on, and yeah. I just went forth with things that I enjoyed. I knew that um, education was, that in a traditional sense, was not the way I wanted to see um, people learn and enjoy learning, and I just went steadf steadfast with um, a vision to yeah. change education, the landscape of education, yeah. and so... Wherever I went, I never thought twice about, um, it's funny, it's how do you forget being African American and female at the same time and from the Deep South, but yeah. I never gave that much of a thought. There were other people who often reminded me, yeah. you know, 
in the boardrooms and outside of the boardrooms, you know that happened because, yeah. you know, and I would say, oh, you know what, I never even considered that. But as leaders, sometimes it's our nose to the grindstone. Absolutely. Or we're, just, we're just moving, 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 I'm right? I'm just moving. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, Samantha Alvarado wants to know, uh, as a brand new CEO at Collaborative for Children, how do you go about gaining the mutual respect and the trust from board members uh, and some of the staff, some of the senior staff? Uh, it's really important, once again, to listen, but to meet with your board members one-on-one. -on -one. Very, very important because... Um, uh, it's oftentimes a little bit challenging for people to say what they really want to say in front of a group. So at a board meeting, yeah. you don't get to know what they really want you to uh, hone in on mm -hmm. unless you meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. And mm -hmm. uh, for staff members, likewise, same thing, um, build a rapport, establish rapport. Um, I'd like to ask, what's a single win for you in the first year mm -hmm. for each one of the board members? Mm -hmm. And, and ten, it tends to be something that you already see very clearly, but you definitely wanted to come from their mouths, and uh, I, th I find a lot of success from that. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I, I find like I want to, and I try to meet with every board member three or four times a year individually, or yes. maybe in pairs. How often are you, you know, in your history, how often are you reaching out to the board in terms of that engagement? Um, you might reach out to them individually more than I do. Yeah, yeah. Um, at the I think I do a lot. I mean, probably. Yes, to which is else. probably quite su quite it successful. Works, yeah, that's me, right. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I probably could take some of that from you. Um, it garners me a free lunch many times. It too, is so definitely a free lunch, oftentimes. <laughs> <laughs> or I don't need that, but it is, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, so I, I don't tend to meet quite as much, uh, quite as often with yeah. them on an individual basis. But any time that uh, we're walking the hallway or whatever, I try and take full advantage of some individual one-on-one -on -one conversation. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. Yes. Uh, Mia J wants to know what your major was in college, huh. undergrad. That is a very good question because, ah. uh, I mean, I had the answer, but um, I studied international business and French. My mother actually was an educator who taught early childhood education for uh, 38 years. She mm. taught the same grade, first grade. And um, I thought I would stay as far away from that as I possibly could because I thought the teachers don't make enough money right? and they don't get any respect yeah. in the community because I was young and hothead, right? And I came full circle and ended up uh, getting a doctorate in education and, yeah. you know, starting my career in the family business yeah, really yeah, yeah. there. Your doctorate was here in Houston, right? It, you, it was, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Exactly, yeah. Um, Star DeLuca wants to know, what's the trait that you feel those in leadership positions, what are some of the key traits? Actually, I'm gonna ask another Star DeLuca question. How do you make sure that you continue to grow as a leader? What are some of the things that you do to grow as a leader? Uh, when I'm different from the way I was uh, previously. So I like to think back when yeah. I'm in, especially when I'm in a situation. Yeah. And I think, you know, how did you handle this then? And I'd love to see myself operate and navigate very differently. Um, just to, because I, I hate to skip to his next question, no, no, but when he okay. says, um, when he asks a question about, um, um, I can't the remember. The trait. Uh, the trait. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's bravery, it's, it's mm -hmm. courage. Mm -hmm. And so I love to see myself um, use courage and Different, with different methodologies, yeah. yes. Wow. Rather than just um, so direct sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes it's a little bit covert. And, um, but I think bravery and, and courage to change and to do the thing that really needs to be done is an important part of leadership. Wow. You know, one of the things, one of the traits we see in a lot of leaders is intellectual curiosity, mm -hmm. right? Just always interested. Yes. But there's always a few areas that people like. And, and you've had sort of these diverse, different, you, you've been a leader, yes. but in different areas. Mm -hmm. Where does your intellectual curiosity really lie? What are the things that, you, that sort of perk you up? Um, I'm quite data driven. I love uh -huh. evidence and I love um, to refute <laughs> The norm. So when I when I hear some data that's significant and it, it, everyone's speaking that, I, I love to try and find out what a local group or you know it might be empirical data, but it may not work so much in Houston. Yeah. And I love to um, to kind of buck that or, or see that that there are possibilities that that, mm -hmm. that can be refuted. Wow. Yes. I, I, I love using data also to refute. People have these myths, you know, these urban yes. legends that they keep uh, promoting. Absolutely. Right? So, 
interesting stuff. Um, so uh, Athena uh, Moss Thomas wants to know, considering your vast experiences in the nonprofit world, what has been uh, your most rewarding uh, experience and why? The most rewarding experience that I, I can imagine, and it's a little challenging to say this, but I worked at Space Center Houston. Mm -hmm who didn't consider itself a museum yeah, because it was uh, managed by uh, those who had been in the theme park business oh. and uh, oh, wow. education was kind of subordinated and it was not it was not something that was mostly pronounced and mm -hmm. um, we had Spongebob and you know commercials about circus shows and things like that and um, I won an award for a the number one museum professional in the country called a Nancy Hanks Award mm -hmm. while I was working at a place that de de denied that it was a museum. museum yeah. And I felt that was quite significant because that took quite a few bruises and hard knocks. Yeah. Um, but I had the courage to, um, to pronounce that this is what we are doing here. This is the work that we're doing and, and it's, it's best for the community it's best for the agency and it's and it's you know it's better for all of us in, in internally yeah yeah wow I, I i could see that being sort of uh challenging as well as rewarding though right it I was mean, very very much both yes yeah. but very rewarding um to stand on that stage in front of over six thousand institutions and and say boy we made it yeah someone recognized us as a museum and yeah, now yeah. henceforth it's it's a museum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah is, uh, when you look at uh, NASA, is it, uh, is it underperforming? Um, not the as an agency? agency? Not the agency, but the, the, the Space Center, Houston. No, I think it's on a strong trajectory. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's on an upward trend and that um, it's clear. Because it seems like such a great asset for Houston, right? It is. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's got a, a clear mission-driven yeah. focus and a good leadership, and I think it's, I think it's doing quite well. My wife had some relatives from Sweden who came to visit us last summer, and that was the number one thing they wanted Absolutely. to do was go down to NASA. It's a destination you know, place. We often don't think about that when we live in Houston, right? But people from outside think, oh, I want to go to Oh, that. they do. Yeah, yeah. And you're right. It's way outside in the suburbs for us. Yeah, so it is. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's outside the loop, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, so Christina Soto wants to know, how important is the role of mem mentorship in the nonprofit sector? Have you had a mentor? I, my mentors, mentors tend to change. Yeah. Um, I'll have a mentor for different reasons. And, um, and then for some reason, I, don't, I can't say by osmosis, I just think uh, the evolution of life and experiences, they tend to move on or I tend to move on. Yeah. Um, I had a mentor, I had a mentor when I was down at NASA at Space Center Houston, I, I had a mentor who, in fact, who had the brave idea to take me up into the Houston area and into the museum in that area or to launch me or to yeah. encourage me to go there. Um, and then no longer was that relationship necessary for either of us. Um, yeah, I've, I've had mentors, but I've been a mentor yeah. and I still am a mentor and I love that. Yeah. Yes. Do you ever? Ha I sometimes have people who come meet with me and say, "Can you be my mentor?" Do you do you have this a lot? I do. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> and it's the the darndest thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, I can't say no, but but I have noticed that uh, for every ten people who ask me to mentor, I mean, I maybe I don't hear from five of them ever again. I Absolutely. say yes, and then they're like, "What happened?" And I wonder if it's something I did, right? <laughs> I'm like, maybe they didn't think I was impre as impressive. <laughs> One on one, as yeah, they, yeah. you know, and uh, some I see a lot. And I say, I thought I was your mentor. You know, I tease them now. Right, right. You know, so yes, I, but I, I love, I love mentoring. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's and people need to understand that it is flattering to ask someone to be the mentor, but you should follow up on it. You should follow and, up because they want it. People want to help. That's right. Um, let me see. Let me ask you another question. Oh, Sarah D starts off War Eagle. Obviously, War she, Eagle, she, Sarah. She, she's, <laughs> uh, uh, so, Tempest, Abby Tempest wants to know, uh, what's been the most inspiring, when you think about working in the nonprofit field, what, 
what inspires you on a regular basis to work in the nonprofit field? Yeah, so my my husband, my counterpart, and, and many of my friends work in the for-profit industry, mm -hmm. and where else can you um, truly live a life on purpose and make a difference yeah. every single day, every morning you get up from eight to five, make a difference. It doesn't matter how hard the knocks are and the, yeah. the punches that you have to roll with, um, you're still making a difference and, and you can you can see it directly. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. It is amazing, isn't it? It is it's, amazing work. It's, uh, I'm sure you, you meet with people all the time, potential board members who talk about in a, in a sense, their wish to save the world. I mean, yes. Um, and yet we get to do that every day, right? Every day, for yeah. a living. For is a that living. amazing right. or what? It is, it is. Yes. <laughs> and, and we have all this psychological salary in addition to our regular That's salary. Right. So That's right. That's exactly right. I love it, the way you say that. It's a really nice <laughs> thing. Uh, so you've answered this a little bit, I think, Melanie, but Myra Rock wants to know, when you think about your career in mm -hmm. its entirety, what are some of the key things that have prepared you for this role at Collaborative for Children? I mean, I've heard a couple of them already from mm -hmm. you, right? Yeah, definitely the um, um, managing from the middle because yeah. I'm able to see what how my team is managing me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but transformation was, the, the is, I think, the best teacher ever because mm -hmm. it comes with so many ramifications and it comes with so many rewards. Um, and navigating it takes so much strategy, and, and timing is everything, and um, seizing opportunity when it comes upon you, and knowing which things that you've, you've got to let go, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, just uh, transformation taught me so much. Yeah. Yes, and prepared yeah. me for this. And while it's not an organization that is in dire need of transformation, just clarity, yeah. um, you know, you learn so much. There's so many byproducts from transformation that it's still essential. Mm -hmm. Yes. When uh, when I moved to Houston the first time, I came to work at Rice. And I remember the president of Rice, I was taken over in an, er an area, and he said, you know, this area is a mess. So this mm -hmm. is an easy job for you, Bob. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, because you could only go up. But here you've come in at an organization which many would see the top. I mean, that's a very hard job where everything's done yeah. quite well. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it is very difficult. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've come to realize that nothing's done perfectly well, right? Yeah. Um, it's had amazing leadership for many, many mm -hmm. years and a, an amazing board and yeah. the staff, the dream staff, honestly. And um, it's probably because of my six weeks in, but I, I still can say <laughs> every day that this is the dream team. But um, yeah, things are done well, but there's always something. Yeah. There's always something that needs to be improved yeah. upon. Well, let me ask you a couple of fun questions as we finish up. Sure. So here in Houston, what's your favorite restaurant, Melanie, in Houston? Epicure. <laughs> Epicure. And I, I'm not certain I go there for the food, but it has the most um, eclectic environment of old and young and um, European and African and Asian yeah. and Hispanic and I, I just, I love that place so much. And so once a quarter, it um, puts a white tablecloth on all the tables and you've got to mm. be on this hidden little email list oh. to get distribution list to get the invitations to that. And they do flamenco dancing and oh, wow. I absolutely love it. It's one of the great things about Houston cuisine though, right? Is that all this diversity in the yes. cuisine. And it's, uh, we, we watch national food shows about Houston and they're always talking about how we have all these different influences. Because we do. And we love it, yes. right? It's, it's one of the great things that we love. That's right. When you think about historical uh, leadership idols for yourself, are they, uh, you know, who is your leadership idol? Those change as well. Yeah. Um, I've also often said um, Coretta Scott King mm. because I'm often thrust into the limelight being a leader of an organization yeah. like yourself. Yeah. Um, but she was able to lead from behind so quietly and so elegantly. And it's, you know, we're always trying to be our better selves and. Mm -hmm. um, you know, take on some of the attributes of, of that we don't possess, and and I I, I admire that mm -hmm. the ability to just quietly sit by, 
and, and not steal the shell and not take the limelight, but the silent whispers in Dr. King's ear mm -hmm. must have been quite powerful in yeah. terms of the movement. Yeah, mm -hmm. wow, that's, that's really good. You're, uh, so here, here are our last two questions. The first one, I'm gonna let you think about it a little bit and then I'll ask you the second one, who would play you in a movie? So, I'll, but what was your, as a, as a kid, what was your favorite uh, uh, TV show as a kid? Uh, Zoom. Oh, Zoom? Yes. yes, loved Zoom. Science on PBS. Yes, yeah. loved Zoom so much because the kids were just able to just enjoy learning the way that I wanted people yeah, to learn, yeah. you know, the way I wanted to learn. And um, I love to enjoy science and math and all of that on, yeah. on Zoom. So who would play you in a movie? Oh, uh, let's see who played me in a movie. Um, <laughs> Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you could get her to play in a movie, right? right? Never not? would that happen, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would only want to play her in a movie. <laughs> yes, but I, I love her um, ability to just, she's such a great spokeswoman, yeah. and um, she's got a heart of gold, and... Also. And there are days that we wish she were the president, right? No, absolutely, yeah, yeah. that's right. More so. days than not, right? Yes. So, very good. Dr. Melanie Johnson from the collaborative, uh, from the head of the collaborative, collaborative for Children. Yes. Thank you, Melanie, very much for being with us Thank today. you for having me. I very appreciate good. it. Yes. And that's it from the Leadership Studio. Thank you guys very much. And keep up the great work. And we'll see you next time right here in the Nonprofit Leadership Studio.